Yo, Christian masculinists. Today we come to you with a current events episode. You've probably heard Melania Trump, aka Melanoma, talking about how murdering babies is good. It happened yesterday. I was reacting to reactions on it before I even know what was going on. I got in a theor very theoretical abortion subsidiarity semi-debate with uh, Edward Fazer on Twitter, and I didn't even know that everyone was reacting to the abortion Trump. It's been very pathetic, kind of leftward shift on this issue, which has been ongoing over the last month or two. I thought it was just that, but I didn't even think that this is a new impulse of information, a new uh, reaction to new stimuli. Anyway, Mike, Will, Nick, the CMAS boys, what I, I, I'm going to play for you this clip by Melania Trump, but everybody take a first blush here. Donald Trump shook the world in 2016 by being the anti-politics politician. He's like, I'm just going to say dope NASCAR, you know, WWE um, fight night kinds of things, MMA red-blooded American kinds of things and like F politicians, F politics. And he won, he won, won the championship of the world with it. Then in 2020, he pretty much stayed the course and whatever happened, happened. I'm not even going to say it. So we get a video taken down, but he didn't have the success he wanted in 2020. Now in 2024, he's set up to win. I mean, Kamala, Kamala and that other dude are paper tigers. And now, and, and it's like, he's, he's trading it all in. Well, what do you guys say first? Um, I, I guess I'll start with the American Nick, 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 and then Mike, and then Will moving in order of less Americanness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I saw Trump's all bold, all caps tweet about not doing a federal abortion ban. And if I didn't know about subsidiarity, I would have been like, gosh, this is just the worst thing ever. I can't believe this guy's pro-abortion. Um, and he's he's not. He's okay with it in you know certain circumstances. But the then I remembered subsidiarity. I'm like, okay, well, actually, that's a good thing. It is a state's rights issue. It should totally be up to the states. I like that. Good job. And then I saw just that black and white video of Melania passing my feed. I had no idea what it said. I wasn't paying attention to it at all until until you sent it. Um and uh yeah then was reminded that she's a Catholic. Um so this is probably something we'll end up getting into today, but the the utility, the social good of excommunicating public facing Catholics for doing something like this um for the, for the their salvation and then for the salvation of the public the church yeah what do you what do you say mike and i, I mean I, I i've i'll say this i think trump is and always has been pro abortion so i don't i don't think he gives an f about subsidiarity we'll, we'll have to distinguish today but um also the good of excommunication just making someone stfu which is all we want from <laughs> so she did for eight years now she opens her big dumb mouth and it's like oh this is why you're just like a spokes you're trying to be a spokes model just be quiet she wouldn't do it for eight years and now she does it and it's the worst message in the world i'll play it as soon as you i'll get a shot here what do you say mike it's better to be to, to remain silent and be thought of as a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt and that's kind of what how i feel about Melania is like you were silent everybody thought you were this based Catholic woman or whatever the lefty weirdos thought she was um, on the opposite on the opposite side uh, this was incredibly disappointed but also kind of unsurprising like all she had to do was just shut her mouth all she had to do was just not say anything and uh, I almost start to wonder like what is their marital dynamic like that even Donald Trump allowed this to happen to her to come th th this was really bad and I think he started to show his hand in 2020 with Operation Warp Speed and all that stuff. And I still think he's the better of the two, of course. Um, now we're essentially voting for the lesser of two evils. Not we, as in I'm a Canadian, but <laughs> looking over the fence at my American brethren. Um, I think Father Ripperger was recently on a roundtable discussion with, um, I think it was Father 
Ambrose and Gabby Castillo. And he said, it's actually not immoral to vote for the lesser of the two evils because you're voting for one that is going to preserve the most good. And so I'm trying to keep my sort of mind fixated there, but this was um, a giant black mark on his, um, his campaign to me. All she had to do was shut up and she didn't. And it was an epic fail. And especially with that dumb accent too. It was just double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tim, you, your yeah. point that he's always been pro-abortion, I think that's the most important one. And the, the question is, with the two-party system, do you really have a genuine alternative? E even the conservatives are just fake conservatives, and it's liberalism when you get deep down to the most important issues. So who is going to make abortion illegal? Who's going to make the widespread propagation of pornography illegal who's going to make easy divorce illegal all of those things inflict grave social evils in the way that aquinas described would justify using the power of the state like to mitigate the damage no one wants to do any of that you don't really have a genuine choice it's the illusion of choice and that's why the political regime is so good at what it does on the surface, Trump seems like he's All-American, NASCAR, MMA, whatever it is. But beneath that, it's the same. Yeah, I mean, look at it this way. Um, I, we, we just celebrated a birthday in the house yesterday for my twins. They're like the least likely human beings to ever do this. But some, some kids, I'm told on movies and TV, on their birthday try to get away with a lot more, more brattiness. Like, I mean, I, I genuinely have the most like grateful kid, particularly the twins. Uh, yeah, no just a grateful kid. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, imagine if you had one of those kids that was like, I'm going to try to like punch dad or say a cuss word or get away with something that I couldn't get away with the rest of the, the year. Cause it's my birthday. That is Trump this time with the abortion issue. And I, I do want to talk about subsidiarity today because like I said, I spent all day saying, I don't like Trump. We were doing birthday stuff and I, we were doing a birthday hike. And I'm like, I don't like Trump, but here's why. It's absolutely retarded to make this a globalist issue. I mean, the, you know, we have to deal with it at the hemispheric level. It's like, no, let's, let's go to Catholic teaching. And you deal with this at the smallest level that has the competency for it. Anything, anything bigger than that, any um, wider valence is immoral. So I did that, and then I didn't know what they're, like I opened up the show talking about, I didn't know that Melania had done this retarded tweet, which I'll play right, uh, play right now, message, and tweeted it out and put it on all socials. And I, But I, I just started realizing, oh, Trump, with the abortion nonsense, is the little kid on its birthday trying to get away with as much as he can because, you know, with as much pro-abortion stuff to pick up as much of the um, centrist energy and the center left constituency on abortion as he can. And to do so, I'm the dad of the hypothetical bratty birthday kid, not one of my kids, who's like slapping me in the face like, haha, it's my birthday. Like, what are you going to do? Vote for Kamala? It's like, listen to me, dumb fuck. I will stay home. I will not vote for your dumb ass. You're not, we, you already did Project Warp Speed. So I don't care about the lesser of two evils. And the, the funny thing is, Ed Fazer's probably stultified because I've been saying, no, the proper way to deal with this isn't it's at the American state level, federal federalized state level, 50 states. I moved to the state that literally gave, that, that ended Roe. And I moved to that state a year before they did it. And I was like, this is the most conservative state in the country. Mississippi overturned Roe. They provided the challenge that went, um, you know, went all the way up and they counted to five or counted to six on the federal court. In Dobbs versus Jackson, Women's Health. Jackson's a Mississippi city. And, um, and all of the red states overturned. Uh, well, after after Dobbs overturned Roe, they all made abortion illegal, just like we said they would. So Ed Fazer's on Twitter saying, no, they wouldn't do that. I'm like, this ship is years old. What are you talking about? It's all cope for people that live in evil red communist states that don't want to leave, like Saurabh and Amari with New York. They just want to 
reallocate uh, the blame to a federal Lincolnian Leviathan so that they can stay in their shithole dystopian t- uh, state and still be like these conservative Catholics. That's lame. I care about that issue very much. That's the main issue, procedurally speaking, that Catholics should care about, subsidiarity. That doesn't mean I'm probably I might not vote for Trump over this. OK, so uh, at the one hand, I'm saying procedurally, this is just right. But that's not what Trump and Melania are saying. So I think Ed Fazer might be who might end up going in. I think he said still voting for Trump. I'm like, I'm, I'm on both extremes of this procedurally. Subsidiarity is the only thing that matters. All 50 of the American states are too big to even count as a legit polity by Aristotle and Thomas's standards, right? They said 100,000 citizens in one polity was too big to count morally and ontologically. So even uh, even Delaware is probably too big, but still it's better handled at the state level than the federal. It's better handled at the county level than the state. It's better handled at the city level than the county level and so on and so forth, like Jefferson said. But when it comes to the substantive issue, I'm less forgiving than even um, Ed Fazer, who, who might go vote for him on this. I mean, I hear this uh, ad by Melania and what Trump has been saying, slapping me in the face to curry the favor of all the center leftists. That does not go well with this sailor. So here's here's Melania. And um, we have to t- I guess we have to talk about this issue today substantively and procedurally to, to at least justify my extremism on both ends. So here, here's what Melania said in this r- retarded ad. Dual freedom is a fundamental principle that I safeguard. Without a doubt, there is no room for compromise when it comes to this essential right that all women possess from birth, individual freedom. What does my body my choice really mean. Okay, that shows she, I'm not sure who made this got, video. Uh, she's got a, a book coming out called Melania. Um, but it doesn't yeah, she sound like an American actress doing a cheap Eastern European accent. She doesn't yeah. sound like she's really from there. I don't know what someone really from there sounds like, but it's just stupid voice, stupid face. Um, we all thought she was Catholic. I'm like this. You'll, you'll never get me back. I'm not pro Melania. I'm done with her. Excommunicator, excommunicator quicker than Biden and Pelosi. For all I care, just just do it. I'm I'm done. What do you guys say? What first reactions to hearing that? Nick, you had something. <clears throat> well, it, it took me until about two minutes ago that I realized two things. The first is that that ad had nothing to do with the election. It was. She thought in the midst of the upcoming election, now is the perfect time for 29 seconds of pro-abortion propaganda to sell a memoir. And the one advertised at the end of that ad is $250 for a memoir. Um, And the second thing I was noticing because the video was far enough away from my eyes, this is just purely a technical thing. um, They just took half of the image and made it darker. I don't know if you can see this, like on the on the ad. Yeah, they're trying to make it look like they're trying to make it look like there's like a sh- like shadow dramatic lighting, but they just filmed her normal and then made half of the image darker, so it looks awful. <laughs> I noticed that. I noticed that it's really weird, right dark side of her face. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's completely fake. Um, yeah, so it's a. Why is she, I don't understand why, well, I guess kind of get it. Um, And Will sort of brought up this point too, like conservatism isn't even close to real anymore. So like the Trump, the Trump family, the Trump name now, like what really, really is different. Mm -hmm. This is a point that I've been trying to make for the last year and a half of, I really hate this lesser of two evils argument when, if you go through all the substantive issues they're they're within striking distance of each other like abortion is a very very meaningful issue so is immigration the difference between like harris immigration and trump immigration is real but not strong enough 
he's still pro immigration. He just thinks like, oh, let's do it legally. It's like we're we're past that now. Um, and then with warp speed, I I don't I don't believe that another global crisis can arise, and the Trump family can stand in the gap and not fold like they did and shut down the entire United States of America, like every other country did and completely obliterate our economy and, and all the small businesses again. Like if there's another COVID heaven forbid, um, I don't see there being any sort of difference. So I mean, the lesser of two evils, it's like less by, by a, a rapidly shrinking margin. And it just breaks my right. heart. Right. And it's not worth some brat that's slapping you in the face because it's it's his birthday and <laughs> is like, no, I can get away with it. I have diplomatic immunity. There's something so satisfying of being like, you know what? You can't you're going to you're going to piss on me to pick up constituency over here. That doesn't sit well with me personally. You're a man. I'm a man. I'm not going to vote for you if you do that. That wasn't your ticket. Your, your ticket got punched because you are the anti-politics politician. Maybe I did that with John McCain, and I, I think I, I did end up voting for McCain and even Sarah Palin. I wouldn't have voted for a guy that put a uh, woman VP on, you know, once I looked at the, the sex politics issue. But I think in 2008, I did. But he was he's John McCain. He's, you know, a Massachusetts Democrat, let alone a Massachusetts Republican. I mean, he is far left. So you know what you're getting there. Trump was not supposed to be the lesser of two evils. Trump was supposed to be that to Hillary and then that to Biden and that to the establishment. He was supposed to drain the swamp. So I'm not going to put up with the same amount that I put up with her. And I totally, I, I totally disagree on this. It's speculation. Um, Melania put this up as part of the campaign, and it's been totally, I think, Trump's attack plan. Other, other people on Twitter agree with you, Nick, but this is all timed out carefully and so oh, I, I i think it's relevant to the election i just meant that it, they're pretending it's not she's she's not saying that that's like therefore register to vote for like donald trump it was yeah. supposedly for her book thing i just thought that it was under the auspices of the election forward facing and it, it took me until you know a few minutes ago to realize she's quote unquote selling a book off of like look look how pro woman Pro freedom. I also think it's so ironic. She's like, women have these rights from the moment that they're born. It's like you're okay. So you're making sure they never get rights. You're you're ensuring women don't get rights because you're killing them before they're born. Yeah, but she didn't but just say wait, guys. Yeah, but just wait. Have you seen the recent Q and on drop, guys? Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. <laughs> just keep waiting, and just keep yeah. waiting because it's going to be biblical. But you just in the meantime, just keep waiting. <laughs> Dude, Punch it. This is retards. His, it's his ultimate plan to save more babies is aborting them first. <laughs> but they're holographic babies. Yeah. <laughs> just wait. Just wait, no, bro. That, that's such wait. a good point, Mike, because you know, in 2018, 19, 20, uh, 19, 20, I started to really get on on the, the Q train. Um and I was like, well, if there's Me a too. deep state, if there's a deep state, maybe there's there's the opposite. There's a good cohort and you know why wouldn't donald trump be sort of at the forefront of this but then um the the greatest paradox was warp speed for me so the for me the person who spent as much time as possible trying to understand the implications of the COVID shot i was like okay so he either is unaware uh, in which case he's not like master commander far side of the world or he is aware in which case he's horribly evil um oh but at least he's trying to save the children or whatever it's like well i guess not anymore <laughs> on on every substantive issue he it, he's not he's not the guy he's not the guy and he was never going to no be other you, you, you can go back on to when we first started CMASK a couple of years ago, and I was pointing out that Trump is one of the most pro-LGBTQ presidents in yeah. history. He yeah. was never going to drain the swamp. He's the swamp monster, right? There's, yeah. there's a deep state, and he's going to just give it to you deeper and deeper. It's just a very effective way of doing it. And I think Melania understands by promoting that book that this isn't really like an election with her book added on. 
the whole thing, the whole political project is now just business. Mm. Like both parties, this is business now. This is money making yeah. and power grabs. What about this? Maybe the last time there was really a culture war in America that meant anything was 1861. Yeah. Right? That was it. Ever yeah. since then, it's just basically been an agreement on all the fundamentals and it's been petty, petty minor squabbles about nothing substantive. Yeah. Yeah. 1861, when based um, Pope Pius the Ninth sided with, I was, I was having Nick read up on this uh, earlier in the week just for, because he was down near Jefferson Davis's uh, birth home, which is like an hour from our houses here. You know, 1861, I absolutely agree. This is when culture and politics actually mattered. It was when men actually fought and died for what they believed in. This is when Pius the Ninth basically sided with the um, American Confederacy. Yeah, you heard that right. Sent a letter. He was the only American, uh, he was the only worldwide sovereign or head of a political state that acknowledged Jefferson Davis as uh, president. And um, he wrote him a, a beautiful letter. What a lot of people don't know is that, of course, um, in 1861, also, there was another northerly, evil, tyrannical incursion into a southerly uh, uh, sovereign body uh, where they stole lands and told them what to do unjustly. And that was in um, Italy, the Risorgimento. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. The general who was holding Pius IX at the tip of a sword and ended up stealing a bunch of his lands and forcing him unjustly into the northern, the liberal northerly uh, union of uh, the kingdom of Italy was named Garibaldi. Garibaldi was a Freemason who hated the church. He did the bidding of a bigger, more NWO Freemason. I'm going to do a show on the Risorgimento soon. And guess who tried to conscript him a year later, I think in spring of 1862, into the, um, the American army, uh, the, the Northern army, it was Lincoln. Lincoln was like, I want you to do to the Confederacy what you just did in the name of pissing all over subsidiarity, what you just did to Pope Pius IX and to uh, uh, the Vatican City State, you know, forced them at the point of a sword into Italy. He tried to get Garibaldi. Garibaldi was, a, um, you know, like Lincoln, Lincoln was friends with Marx. He was friends with Garibaldi, huge liberal, um, hated American subsidiarity, hated what America really stood for, which was states' rights. And, um, you know, so he was, a, he was a tyrant. And yeah, you're not going to get that history in school, but um, Catholics, you know, you shouldn't like Lincoln. The point is, um, I don't know, I, I, I feel a similar kind of energy coming off Trump where it's like, hey, I'm, before I thought he was saying he was going to, do things that were populist right wing from too large a platform. I'm like, no, I have procedural problems with that. Now he's trying to curry favor with the center left and I have substantive problems with it. I, I guess we should spend some of this show dis distinguishing how I have, how one, how a Catholic I believe should have these two views on abortion procedurally and substantively. But I mean, like all of you guys have said good stuff. I, I, um, he just react to the fact that, he, uh, Will did all along, but I don't know. I kind of, I kind of bought in 2016. I'd said he's lifelong pro-abortion because he was whatever then in his 70s, lifelong New York leftist guy who had always supported Democrats until a certain point he flipped, which was recent with respect to when he ran for the presidency in 2016. But he seemed legit. It seemed like a legit flip, and he was just he was speaking off. The cuff. We just come off of eight years of Obama in the teleprompter, and um, no Republican candidate for all my lifetime had had a, a corpuscle of charisma. And then Trump's just making fun of Ted Cruz's ugly wife, and he's saying that the, you know he's making fun of this guy because he calls him retarded, and he's making fun of Rand Paul's hair. I'm like, I love you know, I, I do love this guy. You know, I, I don't think he understands the Constitution or philosophy that well, but he is off the cuff. He has destroyed, he has obliterated that in order to pick up what, 3% more of the popular vote, one and a half percent more of the popular vote. I, I just want to acknowledge that, that I think that's what's going on here. And I'm, I might not vote for him. Do you, do you guys know that letter that Lincoln wrote to the New York Tribune editor, Horace Greeley, 
That really? line yep. when he admits what the war was really about, it reminds me of Trump posing as someone who really cares about politics, but deep down maybe doesn't. Listen to this. This is August 1862. I still think that 1861 was a genuine culture war, but this is still interesting to, to read because it suggests maybe slavery wasn't what he cared about. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. And it's not either to save or to destroy slavery. <clears throat> not told that in school, like Tim says. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the union. So slavery wasn't really the ultimate crux of the war for him. It was the union and political control, which largely comes down to trade and taxation. That's what was really at stake there. But will yeah. the mean racist white guys in the North or in the South we're fighting the mean racist white guys in the north, but the mean racist white guys in the north were just less racist. <laughs> that's that's how America was born. It was born on the backs of that. <clears throat> yeah, that's Horace, amazing. I've never heard that before. Really? That's that that I even heard in school. Now Horace Greeley was a, a committed Marxist. He loved Marx. Um, Marx and Lincoln basically corresponded through Greeley. Uh, Marx published in the New York Times, um, and um, they're big fans of each other because I, I guess we should talk about the procedural aspect of abortion, meaning, um, okay, why, why does subsidiarity matter? Uh, Marxists always like globalism or quasi-globalism. What I want people out there to consider is you know, people that are reciting the last book of the Bible to know that, that part of the apocalypse, I just did the show on the apocalypse on Wednesday, is one world, one new world order that the Antichrist will um, galvanize. And they know that that's bad. Globalism's bad. Every, like, based, Money Moicano knows that. You know, he's an MMA fighter. Uh, he also reads Hans Hermann Hoppe, it turns out. That's surprising. But, but, um, so globalism bad. What cracks me up is people that have had the sense of subsidiarity, the, the idea that sovereignty and localism are mutually constitutive. You can't have um, moral or ontological political sovereignty that's not local, and you can't have moral or ontological political localism that's not sovereign, that they're, they're mutually constitutive. Um, which is everyone knows this. Every kid that's you know fifth grader playing in a basketball league will complain if the ref makes the call from across the court. You know, like, hey, this this ref didn't see it. He's standing right by me. That's that's all subsidiarity is. You have the right to make the call when you're there. You don't have the right to make the call from across the the court or the globe. Basic. It's basic, basic, basic. But um, as it as it relates to this shoot, this issue, it's really important because people are like. Well, this is the murder of babies. Doesn't this violate, um, doesn't this invoke the violation of the one rule? No, it, it, it doesn't. Literally, the political, the, the local polity, the state has the power. And this is always how it was before Roe versus Wade in 1973. All the red states had abortion illegal. All the blue states had it legal. If you want to, Live in a good polity, move to a red state, vote with your feet. It's the fundamental organizing principle of civil society is that your neighbors should not want to cut your throat and, you, you know, your kids throats. It's stupid. Whereas guys like Saurabh Amari in New York, who I guess is a, a concert, he calls himself a conservative Catholic. He's been on every side of every issue in the last 10 years. Um, Ed Fazer you know, very conservative Catholic wants to keep living in Pasadena in Southern Cal. Um, so they just say, let's get Leviathan Lincoln's Lincoln's ghost to do it. You know, let's just get Lincoln to, to, to free all the slaves and, and force everyone to be in the union. And let me legislate from one, from basically a world away. And this is why I bring up the point. And I think I went through this with, um, with uh, freedom tunes when I had him on my show. Okay, so globalism's bad, right? What about one hemisphere government? Is that bad too? Well, obviously, Aristotle and and 
um, Thomas Aquinas and Pope Pius XI, who articulated the idea of subsidiarity in 1931's encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, they would say, yeah, yeah, okay, we can't have two world governments, one for the Western Hemisphere and one for the Eastern Hemisphere. That That is globalism. How about a quarter, uh, how about a half of a hemisphere, you know, uh, whatever that is, a quadrosphere, what government for that? No, that's not local. That's basically what America is, guys. A, a, a third of a billion people, a third of a billion people, and you want to make the claim that this is a real polity for the Catholic political tradition from proto-Catholic Aristotle all the way through Pius XI and even John Paul II. That's not a legitimate political community. What's the legitimate political community? It should be like the size of a, na- a big neighborhood or a city, a polis. That's why all of our political jargon comes from the polis, political, um, populist. This all has to do with the polis, the size of a legitimate political community where you can actually surround yourself in amity and concord with people that believe as you do, which is what you're supposed to do. Like diversity is fake and gay. Your res publica is supposed to be the one thing you hold in common with everyone in your political community. Well, how can we hold something in common with third of a billion people? Exactly. There's no, there's no 350 million people on earth that agree about it enough to be a legitimate political community, which is why Aristotle and Thomas cap it at a hundred thousand. So I was talking to Fazer about this on the abortion issue yesterday, not even knowing about Melania Trump. Uh, or, or her her ridiculous message, pro legitimately pro abortion message, and um, you know someone else popped. Up. Actually, my friend Chris Plants popped up in defense of Phaser. Well, you live in Mississippi. That's more than hundred thousand people. Well, yeah. So I would, you know, so it's not a fully legitimate political community, but it's closer. Also, we don't we're not murdering babies here. I just want people to understand there are three positions on this abortion issue. There's the position that just says, oh, we should have basically globalism and all abortions everywhere, which I'm like, I want all abortions everywhere ended. Same as in China. It's just none of my business. In California, I moved away from there. It's it's none of my business. I want them ended in my political community, which is Mississippi, and we're the most conservative state in the union. But this is what I told Ed Fazer. If you're concerned about globalizing the end of abortion, which I am too, I want it done, but but through political means, through the ballot, then what you ought to be as concerned about China, Chinese abortions as Californian abortions. Because the 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 Catholic political tradition says that it's only your political community you care about, and it's impossible for a political community to be bigger than 100,000. So I said that, and then later in the day saw Melania, and I'm like, okay, I might not vote for him. At the level of the substantive issue, Trump and his stupid wife are both pro-abortion and have been their whole lives. Look at him with, with her hoish modeling career and his you know running around laying pipe. Of course, they're pro-abortion. They're old boomers who have led bad lives. And they're immoral people with dark hearts. So, of course, they are. And and th- I won't vote for him substantively there. But if he meant what some of his supporters are saying he meant, just my distinction about substance and procedure on the abortion issue, then, of course, yeah, that would be the correct position. Can, can you guys parse that? Are you guys square with that? Do you guys disagree with that? I can't imagine a more relevant the central issue of our society and culture right now than abortion. I really couldn't care less about what he's going to do. Let's say if I was an American with taxes or with the economy or with immigration, I mean, immigration is probably the number two thing, the number one thing being abortion because the reality of it is, and this is why I'm kind of like, well, what's the solution? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to come up with the conclusion there, but um, we're living in a landscape. That's just a post-sexual revolution feminist wasteland where the major reason a lot of women are showing up to vote is because of abortion yeah so you see a lot of people framing this as like a strategic move which i can i can see i see as a bit of a capitulation you know i think you're kind of conceding ground but what is the alternative to because if somebody were to come out and be staunchly pro-life and even communicate that with any semblance of tact and articulation, well, there's 50% of the country gone. 
because pe- because people are dumb and they don't understand the sanctity of life. Even a lot of Catholics that are pro-abortion Catholics, which makes no sense. So I'm kind of torn. I don't know. So, and it, 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 Nick, I know you were saying like you hate the the lesser of two evils argument. I hate it too. But then everywhere I go, I kind of run into this wall of this argument yet again. Yeah, I just don't know if if that if so we're allowed to vote for the lesser of two evils because we're trying to preserve the good. Do we as Catholics have a moral obligation to preserve the good by voting for the lesser of two evils? Right. I, like I, I would I was not going to vote because of 2020 in the election theft. Like I've I believe it would just be a humiliation ritual for me to stand in line for them to then just change the the test questions afterward like whatever i answer they're just going to make it for whatever they wanted it to be anyway so like why am i going to do that why am i going to put myself through that uh, but i guess if we pretend for a second like elections have and have had any integrity are catholics obligated to cast a ballot for the lesser of two evils <laughs> does anyone know that answer oh no no you don't yeah you don't have to cast a ballot Oh, good. Uh, yeah, the d- difference between doing and allowing action theory. No, I don't. You don't have. I mean, like, look, in um, 2004, one of his final acts as pref- uh, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger wrote that uh, there are all these fine distinctions on today's show, but um, that the difference between formal co on the abortion issue. The difference between at, at the ballot box when you're voting for for two different politi- for one of two different politicians on the abortion issue, if you vo- if the animating principle of moving your will, literally the intellectual the, the 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 nature the logos moving your will on a given politician is something other than abortion, but it's a pro-abortion politician then there's like no one that can prove this but you then it's just uh you can vote for the pro-abortion politician as the lesser of two evils as long as it is the um remote material cause but if you secretly want that pro-abortion politician on behalf of abortion then it becomes formal um formal cooperation and you share in the sin that the uh, politician does with the individual uh, murder murder some women who are killing their babies. So it's a real it's a really fine decision. And what people have to understand is the status of your rational will and your intellect as you pull the ballot box on a given pro-abortion politician as the lesser of two evils. Literally, the status of that fine finely tuned set of circumstances matters even to your own salvation so mm-hmm. while you can while you can pull yes um for a lesser of two evils uh candidate which trump trump i guess would be here it's not as open and shut as you're thinking because if somehow you you're secretly a little soft on abortion and you vote for pro abortion trump that now you might be going to hell for it. So no, by no means, this is like permissive, not mandatory that you can vote for a, for a, for an evil uh, politician like Trump, an evil windbag who is actually pro-abortion. Um, you just have to be really careful. But if you're like me and you're like, I don't even know, I don't even trust the guy. I, no, I don't have to, I don't have to pull the ballot for the person I think is less. Maybe I think the less, Evil is me not being the F involved. And that that's just where I'm getting with this. When once you discuss, once you draw my moral disgust, um yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's done. I just want to read this is a little bit un un unruly of me. Sorry, I just want to read another 1870s New York Times article. This is really interesting. On uh, August the 18th, 1876, New York Times ran an article about because people might be scratching their head. Pius the Ninth's letter to Jefferson Davis. Don't confuse them. The, the author of subsidiarity, the first person that coined the term in the 1931 encyclical was Pius the Eleventh. This is Pius the Ninth, the circulator of the um, syllabus of errors. Pius the Ninth wrote that letter to Jefferson Davis. Um, it's You can go read the letter. It's up in New Orleans in the museum where he expressed great sympathy that, that they, you know, lost. 
and he, he was the only sovereign who called him president. About that letter, uh, this article is headlined, A Relic of the War and How the Pope Recognized the Southern Confederacy, His Letter to Jefferson Davis. The article described how Dudley Mann had forwarded to Davis, uh, Jefferson Davis, the formidable Latin document, which is nothing less than a recognition of the government of the Confederate States. In Northern Italy, you know, the, the Northern Italians were, were liberals, same as Lincoln and the Northern, you know, the American North at the time represented liberals. According to a letter from Ambassador Marsh, so these are Union people, to, um, to Secretary of State Seward, um, was these are Northerly Union people, Quote, even so unimportant a circumstance as the recent publication of the pu correspondence between Jefferson Davis and the Pope has produced an impression quite favorable to us. And here, so, so Marsh is saying to Seward, both of these are, you know, Lincolnite, Lincoln acolytes, and Lincoln's dead at this point. What they're saying is the sympathy between, between um, Jefferson Davis the southerly, you know, leader of the South in America, and Pope Pius the Ninth, the leader of the South, South uh, Italy, both of whom were basically subdued and forced into this liberal, um, you know, Leviathan, huge continent-sized polity, Italy or America. Um, he said that's that's very favorable to us, uh, liberals of the North. You know, liberals always want more and more landmass. They always want something closer to uh, globalism. Um, he said this, this is, this is really based. It shows Catholics. You really can't like Lincoln or his acolytes because they hated the Catholic church, you know, and supported Garibaldi and all that. Um, Marsh went on to point out that quote, among the friends of progress, the libs in the North and of the federal cause in Italy, quote, the letters between Jeff Davis and Pio, Nino, Pio Nono are thought by many to show that between the great enemy of African liberty in America and the great enemy of all liberty in Europe. This is how Lincolnites refer to the Catholic Church. A sympathy exists which is not shared by the people of the North or the government which represents it. So boom, Catholics, stop being gay for Lincoln. Sorry, I know this is sort of off topic, but I just wanted to get that. In. Conversely, uh, greatest American ever, or General Robert E. Lee, uh, of the Confederate general, he said, oh, the only one who loved our, our poor confederacy now defeated was uh, the blessed Pope. He carried around a picture of the Pope. Uh, Bishop mm. Lynch in New Orleans uh, was was a huge confederate leader, and he corresponded daily with prelates from uh, Italy. Obviously, the South was the representative of subsidiarity, which is the Catholic teaching. And... Um, and there, it was just very, very favorable to uh, the Catholic point of view. They loved the Pope there. Um, a lot of their wives were Catholic in, in legitimate ways, like I think Jefferson Davis's wife. It's just, it's not the story you hear in school, but I, I just wanted to take a second to point that out since there's always this um, preternatural comparison on the tip of the tongue between abortion and, and slavery. I, I want to point out that they're, they're, they're actually not great analogs. Nick, in answer to your question about whether there's a duty to vote, I was just looking up some stuff in the moral theology manuals. This is interesting. Um, so uh, there is a grave duty of using the privilege granted to citizens of voting in public elections and especially primaries for the welfare of the community and the moral, intellectual and physical good of individuals depend on the kind of men who are nominated or chosen to rule. And then they continue with a few qualifications. Uh, the duty is not one of commutative justice as the ballot is either a privilege or a thing commanded by authority, but not a service to which the citizen has bound himself by contract or office. The obligation is therefore one of legal justice arising from the fact that the common wheel is everybody's business and responsibility, especially in a republic. So here's the interesting bit, and it's super important for what Tim was saying about, well, maybe the real lesser evil is just Tim not voting or Nick not voting. That's the lesser evil. Here's why. Representatives of the people 
who by abstention from voting cause a serious damage, which they were bound ex officio to prevent, are guilty of commutative injustice and are held to restitution. But a citizen who stays away from the polls sins and perhaps gravely against legal justice, though there is no duty of restitution for the damages that result. Moreover, in a general election, the vote of one citizen is usually not of decisive influence, and citizens do not make themselves responsible for all the acts of their representatives. So that's similar framing to what Tim was saying with the lesser evil might just be not voting, right? Right. Yeah. Um. Do, 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 do. I, I have another guy saying basically the same thing. This is uh, this is on CNA to provide some insight into this instant question. Um, CNA's Spanish language news partner spoke with Fray Nelson Medina, a Dominican priest who holds a doctorate in fundamental theology from the Milltown Institute in Dublin, and Mario Arroyo, who holds a doctorate in philosophy from Pontifical University of Holy Cross in Rome, Santa Croce. Um, you know, Scott, Scott, uh, works some with them, Nick. Um, um, so elections in the common good, the general criterion for the Christian is always that his action, this is the, the re, this is what's binding on us. And you're going to be like, well, how does this apply? His action or decision not to act leads to or favors, at least does not hinder achieving the common good. The, the latter phraseology is more important for Thomists does not hinder the common good. In countries where voting is mandatory, it seems that abstaining from voting is incurring at least nominally in uh, in a crime. Um, and of course, it's it's not mandatory here anyway, but it's, it's difficult to see how this could be ordered for the common good. Adding that for the same reason, we exclude from this analysis people who out of laziness or not to bother abstain from voting. There's clearly no correct moral motivation there. Uh, the Dominican theologian said that where it is not obligatory to vote, and once laziness or simple convenience has been excluded, it is clear that the only purpose that could be valid for abstaining from voting is to protest that the election process itself is corrupt due to evident fraud or inevitable fraud, or to reject all candidates due to their ineptitude or low moral quality. Those um, are the two reasons why I would do it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Those are literally the two reasons <laughs> I might not vote in a month. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. I, oh I'll, my gosh, it's in a month. It's in a month. It's like gosh. it's like a little it's like a day or two over one month. That's stuck up on me. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, the what the timing of Melania's thing too was of course in tandem with Trump's um tweet about I'm never gonna do a federal abortion ban. Um so it gosh, they really are just trying to scoop up as much as they can. What I don't understand this is sort of side topic this is something that tim you and i have talked about for a while now is i don't know how long if ever it has been the case that the numbers that are collated at the tens of thousands of little computers around the country have ever actually mattered about what shows up on little tickers on cnn and fox news that night I have no idea and there's no way that it's been, you know, can be proven to the American people because when it mattered most, there wasn't an audit when, when everybody was, whatever the answer is, you know, I, I have what I think is the answer, but whatever the answer was about 2020, there wasn't an audit. There wasn't a peek behind the curtain to show every person, you know, when Nick Stumphauser and Tim Gordon pencil in the little, uh, Scantron box, and put it inside the voting machine, that that is one of the numbers that shows up on TV later that night. I don't believe that that's what happens. And I don't know how long it's been the case that that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I I am frustrated by this, what, what I feel is a humiliation ritual, that people of good moral character who are striving to be virtuous are being asked to pretend to bring into office one of two people, both who like honestly just want to kill babies and destroy countries. That's why the I'm recognition one... of politics as business is really important. And uh, the French philosopher Pascal talked about how the fall is prior to politics. 
right? Politics can't save you because it is itself infected by concupiscence and the reality of fallen human nature. So stop looking to the so-called culture war, which is really just two people who don't disagree over fundamentals, to save you. The salvation isn't going to come from the political order. Yeah, so I, I feel like there's more of an obligation for Catholics of good character pursuing greater virtue to stop debating about like i think the issues of feminism um of chastity of um uh homeschooling like it what if what if instead of all these catholics being like i guess i'll vote for trump they all just decided to make sure their wives aren't working and their kids were schooled inside of the home i feel like that would make a significantly greater difference to the country yeah to us like walking around the streets of this country than like the price of gas um in chrysostom's homily on romans he has this sledgehammer point he says i beseech you flee fornication why so where the ground makes it its care to destroy the fruit where there are many efforts at abortion, where there is murder before the birth. For even the harlot thou dost not let continue, a mere harlot, but makest her a murderess also. So if you look what happened with the sexual revolution, fornication skyrockets, so does abortion, because they go hand in hand. So Nick, your point there about how can you really make a difference? Wives working inside the home, yeah, for sure. But even before that, all the single guys just rejecting the feminist framing that fornication is fun. That's Chrysostom's mm. point there. You're already violating the rights of the child through fornication, contraception, which Aquinas ranked just below murder. Contraception and murder are, are twinned. Because if you yeah, prevent the, if you prevent life, you'll also take it. The Naturalization Act of seventeen ninety. Uh, comes to mind a lot when t discussing voting. Like, oh, should women have the right to vote? It's like, first of all, let's pretend like elections are real. If elections are actually real, the stipulations for becoming a United States citizen, like having the right to vote and stuff, <laughs> landowning white man of good character. This is, this is what... It, you had to be at the start of this country in order to have your opinion even matter. So forget the land owning, forget the race for a second. Let's just start with good character. I don't care about your opinion. I don't want your opinion being pulled in with my opinion and then just like averaging it out. If to Tim's point, there's 350 million people and 340 million of them, I probably disagree on everything of substance about. This is nonsense. I think probably we're in an, yeah, probably the vast majority of uh, it's um, the Benedict option is something that I've vaguely heard about, considered, toyed with on my own. And because we're so far gone in the country and in the world, I mean, it's not just the United States. We're actually probably the last bastion. I mean, Western Europe uh, is gone. New Zealand and Australia are gone. Canada is gone. None of these places are ever coming back. And we're, you know, we're right behind them. Uh, I think we do have some more buffer just because we are so big. There's more inertia. It's harder to govern 350 million people in rural areas who all have guns. That is one benefit of a country this size. But given that there is like the whole emphasis on politics as the salvation um, of the family or of the polis at this size is sort of pointless. Um, it does seem, I'm curious if you guys agree that the best thing to do, I think Ripperger kind of said this to me as well. It's like, it doesn't matter what Francis is doing. It doesn't matter what Trump or Kamala are doing to an extent 
to the extent that you have any control over it, obviously it would be better if things were better. I understand that. But in the, in the world that we live in, things aren't better. So stop trying to uh, lean on the world to make your environment a better place, like homeschool your kids. Right. Find some job that makes it so your wife can stay home with them. Don't be feminists inside of the house. Make sure your kids aren't fornicating. And like, who you gives a how, damn about everything else? you see else? how natural the, the orienting instinct is for most of these people to try to reallocate blame for their own like bad lives? You see, this, so this what this means is that subsidiarity is always under attack. Subsidiarity is always like locality and sovereignty are mutually constitutive. Like basically the, the real political community, the catechism says this, is the household. You shouldn't mm -hmm. really even need much outside the household. Nick, you know how my family lives. We don't homestead. The only thing we leave the house for is to get food or maybe to come visit you in, since you've been living here for the last almost year. We don't really leave for other things. And like, yeah, I know homesteaders can do it without leaving the house at all. That wouldn't enable us to, you know, as a family, play so much, play so much, play so many video games, watch so many movies. <laughs> That's the only reason. We, so we stopped to go to the store, but it shouldn't really matter what, what your neighbors are doing. They should be the type of people you can go, you know, you know, they're, they're not uh, going to kill babies if they hit the chance. All my neighbors have Trump flags up, you know, they, they love guns and, and think in God. They're all Baptists. Um, so that's proper to have those neighbors. So, and, and I do have some very nice neighbors that I like. My next door neighbor, I got a friend across the way here. Nick, you know some of them. They're very trustworthy people. Um, so that's there, but I'm not depending on them. But the orienting impulse in all of these folks, call it the, the Saurabh Amari impulse, is he, he's such a poser. He wants to stay living in New York. Can you imagine that? And he's just like, I just want Lincoln. I just want to, I want a, a globalist tyrant to come in and tell us all how to live, even though my reality, Dasein, right? The German expression, Dasein, being there. But what my reality is, is what's an, uh, around me. My, Jesus always talked about your neighbors. That just means people that live near you. Um. I live around a bunch of goons that want to kill babies and let in illegal immigrants and think Marx is cool and think Jesus is, um, you know, made up or evil. But I want to have, have this virtual uh, political reality whereby I get to keep living here because I like tall buildings or whatever. I like Manhattan that just basically puts me in the matrix and makes me believe through violations of subsidiarity that I don't live in this Sodom and Gomorrah political community of New York. Your political yeah. community is like your neighborhood. Um, that's all it is. That all, And thus it is, and thus ever it shall be. That's what I was trying to impart to Ed Fazer. So when people take it to this abortion issue, as, as militant as I am about, okay, Trump and Melania have shown that substantively they, they're actually pro-abortion. I, I might not vote for them now in a month. I don't know. I'm not committing one way or the other yet. Um, if, you know, the procedure is correct. And I got into this with Phaser about a month ago, as soon as this topic came up about a month ago with the national abortion ban, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you define competency, the most competent local government, the smallest sphere government that's competent to adjudicate an issue or legislate it should do it. If you define competency as a hundred percent of them do it, then that you're not going to have that anywhere. I mean, by definition, American 50 states are competent to do it. And the proof is that like 25 of them or 30 of them have done it. They outlawed it. The second of Dobbs versus Jackson City Health, women's health. Um, so if if guys that want that that hate subsidiarity, like Amari or I, I guess phasers come out very strongly anti-subsidiarity, which is weird, if they want to define competency is no, it has to be 50 out of 50 states or else we move the adjudication, the legislative field to the next least less local issue uh, um, um, adjudicator, which would be the Fed. Then check this out. If um, America as a nation were to have some 
emperor come in and ban abortion on a national level, well, that wouldn't be good enough. That's just the equivalent of a state unless all 230 countries in the world have abortion. That would mean you have to push it to the one world government level. So they're all, if, if you run their thought experiment as to what constitutes competency, adjudicative competency, then it, it just it makes it very clear it's globalism. Yeah. Because it's like, hey, 30 of the 50 American states outlawed abortion. Move to one of them or you kind of do share in that abortion, even though not formally. You can be a, a Catholic Californian like Ed Faiso. It's just like, well, I'm here. I don't like it. I vote for pro-abortion policies. OK, but you share in it in a realer way than I do because my political community outlawed it. So move to one of those states. If you say, no, it needs to be 50 out of 50 or else that's not competent, then it needs to, by your own logic, it needs to be 230 countries out of 230. If there's one pro-abortion country in the world, that means we need to move the, the adjudicative competency to one world government that just outlaws abortion. And by the way, that's never going to happen. It's not moral. It's not possible. It's not even ontologically consistent with the definition of what a polity is. Sorry, you've, sorry, you, you've either got patriarchy alongside subsidiarity or the beginnings of some kind of totalitarian police state. And this is why the ancient Greek and Roman political philosophers thought that the father, the patriarch, was the only person in principle capable of identifying with the general interests of the people, which is why people sometimes say that what we do on CMASK isn't really achieving anything, right? We need to be out there running for office or something. But <laughs> actually, patriarchy is some of the most important political action you can take because it's a sphere of influence that we all have that is vitally important because the family is the foundation of society. And the way Tim is framing that, run the thought experiment out, he said, it gets you to see that really clearly. I've got to head off because I've got another call and it's going to end when I go, guys, but there's been a good show today. And I hope people see that patriarchy and the political change that we need are linked. An American who did talk some sense on this topic, I know we've mocked him before, is Emerson. And he talked about how the soul of reform is reform of soul right nice line from Can, him is in you and in your family w yeah. uh will do you have uh, 15 seconds for me to squeeze one yeah, point go in? go go um the squeeze i'm noticing uh, i'm noticing a, a theme with with this which is that um it's the curse of adam through and through from start to finish men want to legislate the environment to be conducive to them as opposed to just doing the hard work it's the same reason why red pill guys want to change divorce laws if we just legislated women to stay and love us everything would be okay and they just don't want to do the work yeah so i, I think that's it's the same thing with this you did no no man no patriarch just wants to do the work that would actually change the country somebody forced her to submit to me give me a bit of paper force her to submit <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't. Even if you had it in your hand, she wouldn't. She'd laugh at you for waving the piece of paper. It's the exact same thing. Yeah, a reallocation to to a larger sphere of authority that'll get done what you ought to yeah. be able to in yeah. your own life. I would just close. My closing statement is in 2020, a lot of people don't know I was originally on the Trump Catholic steering committee and um, Jared Kushner allegedly uh, vetted me off for anti-Semitism. So, so based for me. <laughs> <laughs> good show guys speak next week god bless god bless Take you care. guys